was Friday, and I was still hungover from the Gorgon Wake. My headache was better today, but my stomach was a little woozy. I was sitting in the office, trying to get some normal numbers together since I did have a non-monster funeral to plan for on Monday, when someone knocked on the back door. I heard it waft through the showroom like a raven in a Poe story, and I looked up ominously as the rapping cut into my brain like an ice pick. I sighed, getting up and walking through the showroom to the receiving bay around the back, and the closer I got, the more I realized that they weren't knocking with a closed fist. The irritation I had brewing was probably very Bilboian as I realized that they were knocking with the head of a cane or a walking stick. Great, I growled. If this is a wizard trying to offer me a quest to take a ring to a volcano, I'm going to tell him exactly which crag of doom he can shove it in. I had been in a crabby mood for the last couple days, and it made me a really awful host. The back of the mortuary is mostly storage, but it has a large pair of double doors that we use for deliveries. This is where the bodies usually come through, and when I opened them up, I expected to see a harried ambulance driver with a body delivery when I hadn't been called for about ahead of time, but instead I found a couple of guys standing in the spotlight over the back door. One of them stood directly under the light, like a Broadway actor about to deliver his first line. He wore a long cloak and a suit that looked like it was made of crushed velvet. He had something around his neck that I couldn't help but not call a Dracula trophy in my head, and shoes that looked like he'd stolen them from one of Santa's elves during his goth phase. His face was covered by a bowler hat, and when he looked at me, I was hit with a serious whammy. His eyes were crimson, his smile vulpine, and his luxurious silver hair swept back naturally. He was the most handsome man that I'd ever seen. Like, really handsome. I'm very secure about masculinity, I swear. Good evening, he said, stretching the O and E sound. I am Malcolm Von Trask, and this... He is my son, Cornelius Von Trask. Hey, Cornelius said, raising his hand, and Malcolm made a disgusted sound in his throat like he could barely stand to be near him. As impressive as Malcolm was, Cornelius was such a stark contrast. While there wasn't overtly anything wrong with him, he was just so... normal. His features were softer and less defined. I would say that he did have somewhat of a stocky build, which I was surprised to notice after I noticed the gloves, the leather kind like a driver would wear. This clashed horribly with his shirt, which featured a busty anime girl complete with the word bubble proclaiming uwu for the world to see. Over this, he wore what appeared to be a Hawaiian shirt along with cargo shorts and Birkenstock sandals with socks and a greasy mop of hair. His ankles looked thicker than grandfather's had been before he died, and I felt very sure that Cornelius was doing very little prowling during the day. Malcolm rounded on him. Hey, did you say hey? This is your first encounter with this human, and you say hey. My dear sweet dark lord, your mother would be rolling in her coffin if the sun had not reduced her to ashes. He turned back to me, bowing a little. Forgive the boy, he is new at this. He's only 75 and has much to learn of the ways of the night. I nodded slowly. So, vampires, right? He thumped his cane on the pavement and grinned, showing me his elongated fangs. Indeed, sir. I see our reputation precedes us. Is there some reason you've come to my back door instead of the front? I'm not opposed to taking on new clients, but I prefer that they come in during business hours and, you know, through the guest entrance. Malcolm laughed, tapping a box that I had missed before then. I see your father's sense of humor has not died with him. We are here for your weekly delivery. Cornelius, get the box, will you? Cornelius bent and picked it up easily, but stopped as his father proceeded towards the door. Uh, wait, I, I know the rules, I said quickly. You can't come in unless I invite you. I'm not a fool. I, I know better, too. But then to my astonishment, Malcolm walked right in. I assure you, Mortician, I mean you no harm. I have long had a contract with this establishment and may enter as I please. I choose to knock because it is polite and I am a man of cultier above all else. 
His pronunciation of it being cold here, which gave me a chuckle. Cornelius, however, had not come in, and when I stared at him, Malcolm smacked his forehead and gave me a whining smile. I forgot this is Cornelius' first time. Would you be a lamb and invite him in, purely for matters of business, of course? No, uh, sorry, I said, turning to Cornelius as he stood with the huge wooden box. Cornelius, I gave you permission to enter for the purposes of conducting business and to not eat and murder me. Cornelius nodded and walked inside. Tad gauche, Mortician, but I suppose one cannot be too careful. Cornelius, begin with restocking while I speak with our employer here. Cornelius sighed, putting down the box, and opened the side of it with his bare hands. For someone who looked like kind of a dweeb, Cornelius was pretty strong. He began taking things to the shelves that they corresponded with, stocking my bandages and various tools of the trade. He even got cleaning supplies, which was a surprise. The caskets are, of course, delivered on the first Friday of the month, but if you require more... Do not hesitate to call us. Our caskets are made by vampires? I asked, a little shocked. But of course, Malcolm said. Who else? Wait, I said skeptically. We get our coffins from Batesville Casket Company. I've seen the invoices. Malcolm scoffed. Well, we couldn't very well call it Batsville, could we? Two on the nose, the cattle would figure it out. But yes, vampires are the best casket makers around. We know what we like, and we design them with comfort in mind. I wondered if Malcolm knew the cattle were dead bodies inside them. But I decided not to tell him. So, Cornelius is your son? Malcolm blew breath from his nose. Yes, my only son. I can see your confusion. We doesn't take much after me. Gets his looks from his mother's side of the family. They're prone to large bodies and dull wit. I I can hear you, you know. And thanks to our dark gift boy, you always will. Also, I wouldn't have said it if I didn't mean for you to hear it. I'm sorry to hear about your wife, I said. Did my father do the funeral for her? Yes, well... He presided over the urn. Your father was a saint, a man who understood how to create a tasteful memorial for a woman who is now the consistency of a cat's toilet box. It was a dark part of my life, you understand, and your father was such a friend in my time of need. You must have loved your wife very much. Well, yes, we had known each other for centuries. Our fang marks were on the same villagers. She was... An angel, my angel of the night. Her raven locks, her full lips still run through my mind daily. I miss a laugh, I miss a smile. Her ample breasts that would fit so comfortably in my hand. Her cold, unaging... I, I can definitely hear you, Cornelius said, coming back up with the box balanced on one hand. And I'm done with this stuff up here. Stupendous, then... Malcolm said, clapping his hands together. Let us finish stocking the abattoir so we may extract our payment. I showed them downstairs, guessing he meant the prep room. As we came downstairs, I saw the box shimmying a little and reached up to catch it. The weight of it nearly knocked me over, and when Cornelius took it back, I blew out a breath in thanks. You got it, Cornelius? Yeah, th thanks for the assist. You can just call me Cory if you like. It's less of a mouthful. Malcolm, who was breathing in smells of the cellar, turned on him and I backed against the wall to avoid the rage that he directed there. I'm sorry. What the hell just escaped your otherworldly lips? I told you, Dad. Corey's what my friends call me. By the time you tell people your name is Cornelius, they're already either making fun of you or they've decided your name is too long to be friends with you. Malcolm looked to front, and I half had expected him to pull out a white glove to strike his son's cheek with. The mortician is a client, and I expect a certain amount of professionality in your manner, if not your dress. Your great-great-grandfather, Cornelius von Trast II, would have made sure you knew the privilege of such a name if the Inquisition had not staked him before you were a wriggling in my loins. 
Your namesake had conquered half of Carpathia and a third of Turkey before he was a quarter your age. He was a real warrior, and you are unfit to bear his name. Corey rolled his eyes and got back to work stalking the subterranean basement. This was clearly an argument that they had often, and he was clearly over it. Malcolm came back shaking his head, looking at me apologetically. I apologize for Cornelius. Do not think harshly of him. He is still young. He has time to learn the ways of the night. He seems fine, I said, not really wanting to get involved in their family spats. For a beef eater, I suppose, but he is of the night and he must begin to act like it. Do you know what I came into his abode the other day and found in his bed? A man? I hedged, thinking Malcolm's old-world sensibilities might have been offended. I wish! At least it would mean that he has an interest in something other than his games and books. No, it was a large pillow decorated with a feline woman in a state of undress. It's a docu-mockeroo, Dad, Corey said from deep in the stacks. I don't give a tinker's fig what it's called. The eyes of that shameful hussy will haunt me for the rest of my own life. Mortician, do you have children by chance? Uh, no, I said surprised. Not that I know of. I swear, he said, going on like my answer hadn't mattered. You raise them, you mold them, you try your best to make sure they're prepared for an unlife of dark power and fornication, and they break your heart. He would rather collect toys and talk with his ne'er-do-well friends on the internet than skulk the night with his old man and find some real sport. I told you, Dad, I don't want to be like you, Corey said, coming out of the little space full of shells with the empty crate. I mostly tried to stay out of the way, not sure if they really meant to have this conversation in front of me, or if they had simply forgotten that I was here. And what would be so wrong with being like me? You could be so lucky as to turn out like your old man. I am a creature of the night, a prince of darkness. You are more like a stale bit of gas left in the back alley. You barely leave the chateau, and when you do, it's to attend these gatherings of other sweaty creatures. I remember going to get you from one last year. I saw nary a morsel of palatable flesh in the whole place. It was an anime con, Dad. That's not really the point. We get together for camaraderie and community, not to get drunk and sleep together. Well, I thought. Not unless they had changed a whole lot since I went to them. The two vampires were standing pretty close to each other, and I wondered if I needed to leave. I've seen Twilight enough times, you know, purely for academic reasons, to know that vampire fights could get very destructive. I was mentally counting the denarii that I had in my office, not sure how much it would cost to fix the prep room if they tore each other apart. Hopefully, their estates would take care of it, but who knew? Had it not been for your mother's wish that you find a place in this world... But he stopped and straightened his top. You do not see Darren cavorting about in such a way, bringing shame on his sire and such low pursuits. Ugh. Darren, Darren, Darren! Corey raged. Unless you've forgotten, father, Darren's a Renfield. He's made, not born. I'm your son, not Darren. Yes, and what a shame that is. He turned his back to me as if remembering that I was there and cleared his throat with a touch of embarrassment. Morticia and I will be in your study when the inventory is completed. Cornelius will stay with you in case there are any questions about this week's shipment. I must collect my thoughts. He put the paper in my hand and swept upstairs, his cape making a little rustle behind him. Corey stood there, looking dejected and embarrassed as we went about checking what had been delivered. He shuffled along behind me, and I kind of felt bad for him. It was weird to realize that you felt bad for a creature who would be young when you were dust and who could kill you with a misplaced pat on the back. But I could tell what Malcolm had said had hurt his feelings. Not everyone had the sport of dad that I had when I grew up and I was coming to realize that I might be abnormal in that department. Hey, it's none of my business, but are you okay? That was pretty heated back there. Yeah, I'm kind of used to it by now, Corey said. Dad never made any bones about the fact that I'm not 
living up to his expectations. I'm his only son, though, so he wants me to be a carbon copy of him. But I'm just... I'm just not. I don't... I don't like touching people or being touched. Humans are kind of gross. Uh, I mean, present company excluded, of course. He added hastily. I laughed. No, I, I get it. I can be kind of gross. But wait, if you don't feed off humans, how do you eat? He looked around, trying to make sure that his dad wasn't lurking, before bending down to whisper. <laughs> Actually, I, I... I pay a guy at the blood bank. He sells me bagged blood. I laughed. I couldn't help it. So, like... I was careful to keep my voice low. Like juice boxes? Corey shrugged. Well, yeah, I mean, they... They test that stuff for everything, so I don't have to worry about, you know, getting a belly full of AIDS or something. Would that even hurt you? I asked, kind of curious what a vampire would be susceptible to. Well, I mean, it, it won't kill me, but it's still kind of gross, don't you think? I laughed again, and he joined me this time. Malcolm was waiting for us when I came to the office. He was sitting in my chair, legs crossed like he owned the place, and he showed no signs of rising as we came in. Well, I trust everything is as promised, he said, spreading his hands wide. I nodded, handing him the invoice that I would sign off on. Yep. So, um, what's the damage? How much do I owe you? Malcolm smiled toothily. Oh, nothing so crass. We only accept a specific form of payment. I blinked, unsure of whether he was joking or not. So, check... Denari, plastic. Malcolm patted a chair and took a leather bag from his pocket. Your father's deal was for 400 milliliters, but I think we can let you off with three, since it's your first time and all. I felt a little green twinge pop in my stomach. Was he... was he talking about my blood? How was he going to get my blood, I wondered. Was he... I gulped. Going to suck it out? The thought of his sharp fangs piercing my neck was enough to make me woozy, and each step towards the chair was like a Herculean effort. I sat down and offered my neck, closing my eyes as I invited him to bite me. It always looked like it hurt in the movies, and I braced myself for the pain coming. He'd just chomp down and take what he wanted. I'd be tough about it like Dad had always been. I wouldn't make a scene. I just and the sound of a zipper made my eyes open, and I was glad to see that it was the zipper on the leather case. I love your enthusiasm, young man, but we usually prefer a spot higher on the arm. When he took a fresh needle out of the bag and fitted it for a syringe, I let out a sigh of relief. Okay, so less Dracula movie and more ER. That was perfectly fine with me. Malcolm started to get things ready, telling Corey to hold the bag up so it would fill. He was a deft hand at this, and I began to picture Malcolm working as a phlebotomist somewhere in his spare time, maybe in a pair of blood-red scrubs, soothing people in the process with his vampire powers. I chuckled a little at the thought of Malcolm working as a nurse when the needle came to rest against the big ticking vein in my right arm. See? It slips in, and the blood... Are you paying attention? You're going to have to do this yourself next time, so please, pay attention. Corey nodded and Malcolm set the needle and started the blood flow. I hissed a little as it slid in, but I relaxed a bit as the blood started to flow. This was familiar. I gave blood often and I was used to the process. The guy who ran the big red bus knew me by name, and I had a dozen or so shirts from giving. Plus, their cookies are always fresh and the gift cards never bounce. So, I asked, do you drink the blood? Is that what the payment is for? Malcolm laughed. Drink it? Oh, darkness, no, it's far too valuable. Valuable? I asked, laughing a little at myself. I've got maybe negative. It's usually the least called for. Malcolm shook his head. Not your blood type, you goose. Did your father never tell you about your blood? The rarity of your lineage. It's a wonder some vampire hasn't caught you and drained you dry. What's so important about it? I asked, feeling nervous suddenly. He had a needle in my arm, and now he was telling me my blood was rare. Not great timing. Your family lineage carries a unique blood abnormality. 
It all began when your thrice great grandfather and I struck a particular agreement. He provided me a steady supply of blood in exchange for assistance in his business ventures. The first taste of his blood was an ecstasy unlike anything I had experienced before. Feeling anything at all, particularly for our kind, is a rarity, making the sensation your blood invokes a voracious exhilaration. So what exactly is done with it? I inquired. Why, we sell it, naturally. My blood? Sold? I gasped, my eyes widening in disbelief. I couldn't help but wonder if the blood donation service was aware of this arrangement. Perhaps I should have bargained for more than just a t-shirt and cookies. Well, of course, it's the most coveted party drug among our kind. Typically, we have to dilute it with Minotaur testosterone to prolong its effects. Our clients consume it rapidly, but... Only a drop is needed for a night of revelry. I recall sharing a thimbleful with my beloved wife, and the results were, well, let's just say, memorable. She would ravage me like a... Dad, that, that's enough information! Your mother and I were under the influence of a potent mortician high when you were conceived. Perhaps that's why you turned out the way you did. Your grandfather always warned against mixing true intimacy with illicit substances. Regrettably, I did not heed his advice, and now I must face the consequences. Malcolm reflected solemnly. I was still reeling with the knowledge that my blood was a vampire street drug. I wondered if Dad had known, and then I supposed that he must have. If Malcolm was this chatty with me, someone who was a relative stranger, then he must have told my dad way more than this. I wondered why he never told me. Wondered again why he never told me about the monster mortuary as well. I would have helped. I wouldn't have judged him. But it felt like now, as the blood slips out of me, that it might have even made this part easier. But maybe it had to be this way. Maybe the strangeness was part of the transition process. Maybe this was just the nature of doing business with something that we didn't understand. I laid my head back feeling floaty like I usually did, and when he took the needle out, I felt him press his lips to the wound and begin to drink. I glanced it down and there was Malcolm, running his tongue over the wound and lapping at the blood. And to my surprise, it didn't hurt and as I watched the wound begin to seal up, he looked up, grinning at me and making eye contact before he turned to offer Corey some. But Corey declined, clearly not wanting a sample. And when Malcolm chastised him, it was like hearing voices from the next room over. You're turning your nose up at something worth $1,500 a vial, I'll have you know. Ugh, you, you know I don't like drinking like that. Corey said, not even looking at me at this point. What? Would you like something a bit less hairy? Malcolm said, sarcasm dripping. Well, excuse me. I'll see if the fine mortician can birth you a daughter next time. For now, if you want some, you better get in here before... Oh, drats. Too late. The wound is closed. Fetch him some juice or something. Make yourself useful for once. Corey scuttled off as my vision stopped swimming quite as much. I saw Malcolm put away his tools. I looked down at my arm, but there wasn't even an insertion mark. No blood, no wound, not even a band-aid to mark the presence of a wound. It was a shame that the hospitals didn't have access to whatever this was. It would really cut down on wound care time. What happened? I said, trying to sit up and then laying back down as my head started spinning. Easy there, little soldier, easy there. Cornelius has gone to get you some juice. You need to replace that sugar you lost so you don't fall and spill that very valuable blood all over the floor here. Corey came back with a glass of orange juice, and I had to force myself not to gulp it down. Now then... Cornelius will be back next Friday with your next shipment and your next delivery. Your manifest is due at the start of each month, so let us know if you need anything for the following month on our next visit. You aren't coming next week? I asked, not altogether upset by the news. Sadly, I fear you've seen the last of me for quite some time. Cornelius will be taking up my route here, a show of manhood while he finds his night legs. He said, clapping his son on the shoulder. Look, looking forward to working with you. 
Corey said, bowing a little. Um, you too, Corey, I said, and he smiled as I used the name that he preferred. It wasn't as unpleasant as I thought that it would be. Malcolm rolled his eyes. We'll be going then. Come along, Cornelius. The two vampires took their leave, and I was left reclining in my office chair with a half glass of orange juice. It appeared my Fridays would be a little more exciting from now on. Sorry about that. The film came off the reel again. Normally the Mortician would have had this thing running smoothly, but he's currently elbow deep in a spicy little minx. Real shame she's dead. Ha <laughs> ha! Anyway, let me get this fixed for you. I was sitting by the back door, watching the sunset over the woods the first time that I heard it. There was whistling from the woods, low but continuous, and it was more than a little infectious. I was still in my apron and work pants, and the basement work was usually a little too messy for my suit and tie, so I lifted my head as I heard it. And for half a moment, I expected to see my dad walk out of the woods and come home after a walk. The melody was familiar, something that I had heard him whistle a hundred times. My rational mind knew that it wasn't him. I had seen him go into the ground myself. But a part of me was still hopeful. I took a step back into the back lot, my legs wanting to investigate, when I remembered the last of my dad's rules. After service concludes and the bodies are in the ground, if you hear the whistles from the nearby woods, go inside, lock the doors, and do not leave the house for the next 12 hours. Still, the second step was easier. The third made me feel lighter, and I almost imagined that I could see him waiting for me at the edge of the forest. The fourth step was half finished, when my watch buzzed, reminding me that I had an appointment tonight with Mrs. Robinson to speak about her husband's funeral. I glanced back, but the shadow was gone and the sun was a bright line across the rim of the trees. The rules flashed back through my mind, and I booked it back inside and closed the door. I could hear feet above me and I realized that my appointment was more punctual than I was. I put the apron that I was wearing on its peg, got my suit coat back on, and traded my rubber boots for loafers. Whatever that had been, it wouldn't be getting in here tonight, and I tried to put it out of my head as I headed upstairs for my meeting. They were waiting for me in my office, and I was half away to my desk before I got a good look at them. I'm so sorry. Um, I was finishing up some business downstairs. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you, Mrs. When my eyes fell on the trio... The blood ran out of my brain and headed south like a pack of spring breakers on their way to Panama City Beach for the week. The three of them sat there, looking for all the world like an intro to an adult film. My mind couldn't help but think back to the letters sent in to Hustler or Maxim. These ladies were the Billy Goat's gruff of baddies, and as I took my seat, I was glad to have the desk to hide my excitement. Mrs. Robinson, and these are my daughters. We would like to have a funeral for my late husband, said the voluptuous mother, I assumed. Dear Penthouse, I thought, let me tell you about the three morning hotties who came into my office. Uh, okay, um, I said out loud as I took out my notepad. What sort of service were you after? Nothing too fancy. Just a small gathering of friends and relations to mourn his passing, with a catered event to follow. Mm-hmm, I said, scribbling. What sort of food were you looking for? Something decadent, she said, and when she said that, I could hear her practically roll around in the word. Desserts, fondue, perhaps a chocolate fountain? I cast a curious glance upwards, but quickly looked away as the woman to Mrs. Robinson's left delivered a sly wink, and despite their human-like appearance... There was an intangible quality about them that suggested a deeper essence. Mrs. Robinson radiated the elegance of a high-class madam straight out of a 1930s burlesque film, 
adorned in a cocktail dress, a black overcoat trimmed with a mink stole, and holding a cigarette holder with poise. Her companions bore the resemblance of elite escorts featured in exclusive catalogs that demanded a credit card check for access. The woman on the left exuded the allure of a supermodel, boisting a slender figure, luminous complexion, and generous curves and flowing red locks. Tattoos adorned her arms and neck, adding to her captivating appeal. But in contrast, her companion resembled a librarian from a provocative film. Sporting glasses more for style than necessity, her hair intricately braided and secured into a ponytail atop her head, hinting at resilience. Her makeup struck a balance between practicality and seduction, enhancing her enigmatic charm. Dressed in mourning black, their attire hugged their figures as it poured into them, perhaps with a tad too much poured in. Each exuded feminine charm, Hollywood allure, and a perilous magnetism capable of leading men to financial ruin. It took every ounce of self-restraint to resist the urge to shower them with money, envisioning a scenario where they'd claim it back in court after a night of ill-advised passion. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, think that we can get a couple of chocolate fountains, um, now as, uh, a as far as the service. Absolutely no priests, Mrs. Robinson went on. They aren't exactly on the same level we are. We want testimonials by friends and family about how my dear Wayne touched their lives in such an intimate fashion. It should go on for about an hour, then another hour or two for refreshment. With bated breath, I dared to steal another glance upward, my hand involuntarily scribbling on the page. The woman seated to Mrs. Robinson's right locked eyes with me her eyes brimming with fiery intensity as she flashed a devilish smirk. And without uttering a word, she gestured with a subtle tilt of her head, coaxing me to redirect my gaze downward. As I complied, she gracefully uncrossed and crossed her legs, offering an unexpected anatomy lesson. Keep it together, Tyler. You're a professional. You do not fall apart over pretty girls and their lack of proper undergarments. It's not the first one that you've seen, and it hopefully won't be the last. With the other sister on her left noticing her sister stealing my attention, she quickly mimicked the maneuver with more zealousness. I thought that I'd have to check my chin for drool. Uh, yes, that's completely doable. Um, any particulars you need for the service? Flowers? Seating requirements? Mrs. Robinson stroked her very alluring chin. Smiling, she noticed me noticing. Does your chapel have a stripper pole? We were hoping for two, but one would be fine. I had to put forth a lot of effort not to snap the cheap big pen. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, what? A stripper pole, she repeated. It's a part of our mourning process. We can add a little more onto the bill if you'd get a few installed. If not, we understand. It's so hard to find modern facilities with a good pole in them. At my father's funeral, they had, thankfully, recently burned witches in the area, so we cleaned off the bodies and just winged it. I stared at her for a moment, trying to see if she was joking, but she had one hell of a poker face. Both daughters again uncrossed and crossed their legs in unison, like a pair of synchronized harlots, and I sighed in exasperation. Mrs. Robinson laughed, <laughs> a sound like silk rubbing over naked flesh. Girls, please. If you give the morticians a heart attack, then we will have to look for another place to have the service. Although... She paused. He is handsome, like his father. You, uh... You knew my dad? I asked, making more notes as I tried to make some calculations. Oh, yes, Mrs. Robinson said with a smile. Intimately, if not carnally, he helped me bury my first and third husbands. If I'd had it my way, he would have been my second and fourth husband, but there was always some paltry reason why the timing wasn't right. She said, sounding maudlin. The paltry matter wouldn't happen to be my mother, would it? I asked. Oh, is she still alive? Such a shame she outlived him. But I dare say a night with me would have been the end of him. The old ones are fun, 
but their bodies just never last. Some of the allure had dwindled now, and I was beginning to temper my desire with anger. I see. Hmm. I don't think that the stripper pole is going to be doable. We have a strict policy on not altering the structural integrity of the chapel for services. <sighs> a shame, she said with a sigh. What about jello pools? Inflatable would be fine. I mulled it over. Uh, I guess if we put some tarps down, I suppose two might be doable. Excellent, Mrs. Robinson said. It would mean so much to my girls. They love their father so much and would love to dance for him one more time. I gulped, doubting that this would be like any dance recital that I had heard of. These two girls seemed more likely to dance to Baby Up Back than Swan Lake. So, shall we say Saturday evening for the service? Mrs. Robinson said, offering me her incredibly soft-looking hand as she leaned forward, and I mustered the last bit of willpower I had to keep my eyes fixed on hers. I checked my calendar, and yeah, we had an opening on Saturday. I shook on it, and when my hand came free, I had to work very hard not to smell the incredibly whatever it was that came from it. Wonderful. Well, we will see you Saturday. I trust you can make the arrangements before- Whoa, 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 I said as she and her liaison started to leave. We have to discuss payment first. She smirked, purposefully leaning deeply forward so I could get a good view of her ample bosom. Oh my, it's terrible to discuss payment with such a recent widow. Perhaps we can talk about it after the service? I shook my head, trying to clear the whammy she was trying to throw my way, but only half succeeding. This was definitely a woman who could charm the birdies from a tree and likely suck the sorrow off a recent window. I I'm sorry, ma'am, but it's always been the policy of this establishment to have payment up front. She sighed, side-eyeing both of her daughters before turning back to me. Very well. I suppose you can have one of them for the evening, but I really don't think it's worth both. Talia and Victoria are professionals, so it's more than a fair deal. If Victoria's game, I'd be interested in joining. The one looking like a librarian purred. See? Mrs. Robinson said. A two for one. People have mortgaged Fortune 500 companies for a night with just one of them, and you could have both. Sure, I thought. I bet that they would just love my video game posters and model airplanes as they try to crawl into my bed barely even big enough for me. Not very tempting, ma'am, but I need money. She snorted. What better currency is there than flesh? Uh, well, I guess last time I checked, I couldn't pay my power bill with sex appeal. Spoken like someone who's never tried. <sighs> Mrs. Robinson said with a sigh. She went digging into her purse, but I was suddenly aware of the stares from her daughters. I had the attention of both Talia and Victoria and I wasn't really sure I wanted the scrutiny. At first, I wondered if they were angry that I had rejected them, but the look went deeper than that. It was the look that a lioness gave guzzles who managed to get away from their killing claws. It was the look that killer whales gave seals who made it to the shore in the nick of time. It was a look, a needful look, and I tried to keep my head up so my unease did not show. This is why I didn't go to big cat houses when I'm at the zoo. No one likes to be looked at like dinner. Do you take sulfurions? She asked, holding out a handful of what looked like Monopoly money. Those are... I asked, not putting out my hand until I was sure she wasn't trying to hand me play money. The currency in hell, duh. The exchange rate on the surface is abysmally high. Most people want a little leverage when they descend, so this should more than cover it. She handed me the stack of bills and I groaned inwardly at the idea that I was going to have to take this somewhere to exchange it. I was probably sitting on a small fortune between this and the denarii in my desk. I needed to exchange it, and I needed to get some cash to pay the bills. I needed to see Louie, the Gorgon sisters had talked about. Uh, thank you, I said, giving her a smile as I walked them out. I'll get it all set up, and I'll see you Saturday. It's a date, handsome. She said, leaning in to kiss my cheek before departing. 
I could feel the heat of that kiss. A heat that traveled from my cheek and up to my brain as it tickled my hypothalamus, and the heat from the other parts of my body as I watched them depart. The phrase, hate that you're leaving but love to watch you walk away, played through my mind, and decided on a cold shower before I started getting ready for bed. Tomorrow was going to be busy, and I needed a good night's sleep and a clear head to cease it properly. The phone rang three times before it was abruptly picked up by someone who sounded like they were out of breath. This is Louie, said someone who sounded like they had swallowed a voice box. Here for all your financial needs. At the tone, input your personal code using your keypad in the next 30 seconds to be given an appointment. There was a tone and I glanced down at the card Dad had put in the Rolodex to see if it had any clues. On the back was a series of numbers that I pressed slowly so I could be sure that I didn't mess them up. About five seconds after the last one, the robot voice came back. Welcome, mortician. Your appointment is at 11.34 tomorrow. Do not be late, or you will have to reschedule. And then the line went dead. I looked at the handset for a moment before hanging up. I guess I had an appointment tomorrow. How nice. I could exchange some of the money and get the things that I needed for the incubi funeral. Mostly food and booze, not to mention the tarps and pools for the jello dancing. And that brought a warm feeling in my nethers that I tried to suppress. My imagination tried to treat me to a look at the two succubi sisters as they moved amidst the semi-solid mass beneath them. Would they wear swimsuits? Would they wear anything at all? I tried to squash it so I could get some work done, but it was really distracting. I heard the front door open as I started to look at figures for the Robinson funeral and waited for someone to walk back to the office looking for me. It was the middle of the day and most people had enough sense to come to the back if they had business. I heard someone walking around out there, but they didn't so much as cough to get my attention. Finally, I sighed and straightened myself as I stepped out of the office. Welcome to Garvey Mortuary and... I started, but then I caught the woman in profile and felt the heat in me rekindle. She was wearing a long coat, like something that you'd wear in the rain, and that braid was hanging down her back like an invitation. She had her back to me, letting me see her profile as she turned her head ever so subtly. The braid swung a little bit, moving like a metronome between her shoulder blades, and I was speechless as she spun to face me. Talia. This was definitely the one who reminded me of the librarian, and the glasses were a part of her daily look if they were an act. Talia, I said. Uh, what are you doing here? She smiled, letting the coat open to reveal a lot of very appealing flesh. The leather corset was very nice and the boots came up to her thighs and the little bit of leather that was maintaining her modesty was working overtime. She smiled as I stood there speechlessly and my breath hung in my throat when I noticed something else that I hadn't seen yesterday. There was a pair of black wings and a tail protruding from her back and just above her butt. How cute, she said. I like my men cute and dumb. Come on, she whispered, and the words hit me like a mist. Let's see how comfy these coffins are. She wrapped herself around me like cellophane, and she planted a kiss on my neck and I shuddered in realization. I, uh, if we mess up the caskets, I, I have to absorb the cost. She seemed to think that this was very funny as she put her teeth against my ear. <laughs> Are you afraid we'll leave stains on the satin? Uh, kind of, I admitted. God, did I want to, but as I pushed her back, I took a step away from her. I felt her grow rigid in my hands. Wait, 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 no. This isn't happening. I started trying to come up with reasons why I couldn't do this, despite really, really wanting to. Her face went from alluring to downright feral. You deny me? You. Not once, but twice. You deny me. I... I was just trying to move some of the blood back up to my brain. I, I don't sleep with clients. Uh, it's unprofessional, and it's a rule that I won't break. Not to mention I was starting to put some pieces together in this puzzle. One of Dad's rules had started to bob to the surface of my fuzzy brain and I latched onto it like a drowning man. Succubi do not love you. 
and never will. Talia looked at me as though she couldn't fathom what I was talking about, but the feral mask broke a moment later as she started to laugh. Mother said your kind would be difficult, but I had no idea you'd be so elusive. Very well, she said, closing her coat again and flicking her head so the braid went back across her back. We will test your resolve and see how strong you truly are. She walked away then, her boots clicking as she took her leave. And I just stood there, not sure what I wanted to make of all this and wishing that I just kept my damn mouth shut. What the hell? I whispered to no one in particular. And when no one in particular gave me an answer, I went back to the office to try to get back to work. An hour later, I managed to get the budget of what I needed, and I started to look at the funds that I had available. I had just under 5,000 denarii left, and I had what looked like about 2,500 sulfurians. I didn't know what the hell currency was worth yet, but I kept about 3,000 of the denarii just in case I needed to hire Cerberus again. The succubi hadn't said that they needed security, so I hadn't bothered Jericho. God only knew what the succubi sisters would make of him, and... I was actually kind of just tempted to hire him just to see if they could fluster the stoic fella. And I was tempted, but I really didn't want to spend 3,000 denarii on a goof. And I called the liquor store in town, Top Shelf, and they said that they had enough Everclear and Bacardi to get the job done. They also had absinthe, but wouldn't sell me the quantity that I wanted, so I had to call around. The party sprees had chocolate fountains that I could rent, and the Publix had the fruit and other delicacies that they wanted to dip it in. They also had a wide selection of desserts, so I got a few. I was talking with the girl at Walmart to see if they had any of the large inflatable pools when someone knocked on the receiving door. I looked at my watch and discovered that it was nearly one. I wasn't expecting any deliveries, and not by regular delivery people and not from Cornelius for another two days. And so I finished up with Walmart and hung up so I could see who it was. I was expecting someone from the morgue, probably an ambulance driver with orders for me to store a body overnight, but instead, it was a UPS driver in a traditional brown uniform and uncomfortably short shorts. She looked up, smiling, her scanner in hands as she read something on it. You Tyler Garvey? She asked. Uh, yeah, do you have a package for me? I asked, looking around and not seeing it. When she surged forward, I jumped back and barely missed being grabbed in a very personal manner. No, but you've got one for me, big boy. She took her hat off, and her red amber hair spilled down her back, and I saw Victoria leaning against my receiving door. The wings sprouting from her back were equally as noticeable, and she grinned as she saw me seeing them. Like them? I usually keep them hidden on the first meeting, but they can be quite useful. Why not come test them out? You can grab them and pull me wherever- But she never finished the thought. She found it very difficult when I closed the door in her face. I'm not interested in whatever game this is. Tell your mother that I'm not refunding any of her money just because she wants to send me booty calls. She screeched like a demon and when two large dents appeared in the thick fire door, I stumbled back a little. I was bold, but I wasn't suicidal. You can't get away from us that easy, human. No one denies a succubus. Either my sister and I will have you. Count on it. By the end, you'll be begging for more. She stomped off then, and I found dents in my parking lot later when I went to take out the trash. I sighed as this was kind of getting old. A man's libido can only take so much before the game got a little stale. It appeared that I had sparked something by denying them. And the thing was, I did want them. God, did I want them. But I wasn't just going to give them what they wanted just because they wanted it. I'd been to high school, and I knew what happened when you gave in to the demands of pretty girls. And suddenly... We were doing all of their homework, taking the heat when their other boyfriend sent them flirty texts their real boyfriend found out, and following them around like a whipped puppy just hoping for scraps. I was an adult man, and I wasn't in the mood to backslide. Now, I'd like to say that that was the end for the day, but it wasn't. 
30 minutes later, a busty Domino's delivery girl tried to deliver a pizza with extra sausage, and I didn't even open the door. And after that, it was the police trying to serve a warrant for my arrest. That one may have worked, but I recognized the braid from a mile away and told her to shove it or get a search warrant. And as the sun set, I locked the doors and decided to make an early night of it. I had an appointment tomorrow with Louie, a trip to Publix and Walmart, and a lot of things to do before Saturday. All the potential shenanigans today had also taken it out of me, and I was pretty exhausted. I checked the receiving doors and the front door, and I was also checking the basement, when I heard a very weird noise. There was a rattling coming from the freezer room. I peeked around the corner and waited for a repeat of the noise. It was probably just a bird that had gotten in earlier, but as it rattled again, I realized it was exactly what I thought it was. Maybe I was hearing things I hoped, but as I took a step forwards to the cabinets that currently held the body of a single person, Mr. Roush from the next town over who would be going to the Golden Gale funeral home tomorrow. If it was him banging around, he could leave right now, with help from me and the broom that I kept down here. I grabbed up said broom, but as the rattle came again, I realized it wasn't the drawer Mr. Roush occupied. It was the middle drawer, the dead center drawer, and I held the broom tightly as I crept forward. I reached out shakily to grab the handle and pull the door open. Mist rushed out as the cool air hit the warm air of the basement. The drawer came out on its own, rolling smoothly from the freezer, and on it lay a very beautiful woman. She was naked, and most of them were when I put them in there, but she didn't have any of the scars that followed an autopsy or funeral prep. Her blonde hair was cut short, her arms crossed over her chest, and I had no idea who she was. I hadn't checked in anyone except for Mr. Roush, and I heard the broom clatter to the ground as I shuddered, the fear welling up in me. I tried not to run. If she was some kind of boogan, they really liked it when he ran. As I watched, her eyes popped open and I emanated a sound that no grown man should ever make. The girl smiled, rolling onto her arm as she cocked an arm under her head in a suddenly seductive manner. Like what you see, handsome? My fear fermented into rage in about ten seconds. Because I recognize that voice. Victoria, get out of here now! She pouted, hopping off the drawer and putting her hands on her hips. Party pooper. I thought you morticians like dead bodies. Get out, I growled, following her up the stairs. I let her out the front door, slamming it behind her and not caring if she had to walk naked to wherever it was that she came from. And I went straight to bed after that. Screw the cold shower. I was done with today.